The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Capehart with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. Welcome to the webinar. The title of today's webinar is Trauma-Informed Care Approach to Elder Abuse, and I'll introduce our speakers shortly. Uh, next slide. A couple quick disclaimers before we get started. The Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center, or APS TARC as we call it, is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, administered by WRMA Incorporated. The contractor's findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Next slide. Uh, this project that we're talking about today was supported in part by a grant from the Administration for Community Living, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Grantees carrying out projects under government sponsorship are encouraged to express freely their findings and conclusions. Therefore, points of view or opinions do not necessarily represent official ACL or DHHS policy. Uh, next slide. Quick note about our APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. We are here to help APS programs in any way that we can. Just reach out to us. Contact information will be displayed at the end of the webinar where you can reach out to us if you like. Um, we work to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. That next slide. Please consider joining one of our peer-to-peer -peer calls. We have three calls of this type each month. Um, one's for investigators or workers, one's for supervisors, and then one's for administrators. You can see the schedule here um, of these particular calls. And um, you can check out our website or email us if you'd like some additional information about how to join these. Um, next slide. We also have a page on our site dedicated to COVID-19 and Adult Protective Services. Um, there's a link um, to this page in a red box at the top of our website if you just Google APS Dark. And again, you'll see the, the web address at the end of the webinar. Um, on this page, special page, you'll find resource information and a summary of state program responses to the pandemic. Uh, next slide. And a bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, this session is being recorded. It will be posted to the web at a later date, and we'll notify all of our attendees and registrants via email when it's posted online. If you have questions of our presenters, simply type them in the questions box at any time. We'll pause for questions at the end of the webinar, and we'll get to as many of them as we possibly can. All participants are muted for this webinar, and you must use your computer to access audio. If you have any problems with the audio um, as we go through the webinar, we suggest exiting the webinar and then re-entering. That seems to fix a lot of the problems. Uh, next slide. Now, a quick poll to get a feel for the location of our attendees. I am going to launch this poll for us right now, and you'll be able to click on your screen. Um, to let us know which of these options best apply to you and where you're joining us um, from today, either the West Coast, Midwest, the South, or the Northeast. And again, you can just click directly on your screen to respond to this poll. Looks like we got a bunch of results coming in. I'm gonna keep this open for just a little bit longer to give everybody a chance to vote. And again, you can just click directly on your screen if you'd like to tell us which of these apply to you for where you are joining us from today. All right, we'll keep that open for about 10 more seconds and then we'll close it out and share the results with everybody. So I'm gonna close that poll out now and share these results. It looks like the majority of you are from the Midwest at 32%, followed by Northeast 28, the South at 22, and then the West Coast at 18%. That's a pretty good, pretty good split actually among the um, attendees. So thanks for responding to that for us. Um, next slide. Now, I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Um, Maika Bledsoe is a licensed marriage and family therapist and works as the lead therapist for Human Options in the Safe Options for Seniors program. In her role as lead therapist, she provides individual and family counseling, facilitates groups, and provides educational presentations and trainings on elder abuse. Maika also serves as a member of the Orange County Elder Abuse Forensic Center and the Financial Abuse Specialist Team. She received her Bachelor of Arts degree at California State University, Fullerton, where she also received her Master of Science degree in counseling. 
Maika has been trained in EMDR, is a domestic violence and sexual assault advocate, as well as a trained facilitator through a window between worlds, which utilizes art as a healing technique for victims of abuse and trauma. Our other speaker, Sheree Fowler, is an associate clinical social worker who specializes in providing case management services to older and dependent adults, adult victims of abuse. She has worked as a project case manager for the Elder Abuse Forensic Center for several years, both in LA County and currently in Orange County, California. In addition to serving older adults, Sheree is also a clinical therapist providing individual and group therapy to women who are serving the remainder of their prison sentence in a community-based treatment program called Community Prison Mother Program. And we are very lucky to have these two women with us today. I will now turn things over to Sheree and Maika. Hi, thank you, Andy. Um, next slide, please. So my name's Sheree. I'm going to start us off with this presentation, um, a trauma-informed care approach to elder abuse. Um, and our goal for this presentation is to be able to increase the awareness to you all, community service professionals, and providing this trauma-informed care approach to the older adult clients that we serve. Next slide, please. So just a quick disclaimer um, before we get into the presentation. Um, we will obviously be talking about trauma um, and some traumatic situations um, will be discussed, not necessarily in, in depth, but um, will be brought up. Um, throughout the presentation and um, in no way is our intention to trigger anybody um, throughout this presentation. We're aware that we all have our own personal stories and histories and in some of the things that we may discuss, um, we're aware that there might be um, some trauma that um, might be brought up in the presentation. So if you are feeling distressed or uneasy about any of the topics that we're discussing, we do ask that um, you take care of yourself. That's the first important thing. And if you need to take a couple of minutes to step away from the computer, whatever that might be, we ask that you just take care of yourself for that moment. Um, and you can join us back um, if you uh, so choose. And next slide, please. And so again, our, our learning objectives and the purpose of the presentation, um, we will first be addressing what constitutes trauma and the effects that trauma has on um, an individual's brain. Um, we'll also be learning to recognize um, how trauma may be impacting our clients and um, their current circumstances in which they present with and their behaviors that they're presenting with um, when we provide service, services to them as well as understanding the instinctive um, survival responses that an individual may experience so as a result of a trauma. We'll also be um, talking about the six trauma-informed care principles um, to implement in working, that we can implement in working with clients um, and how this can um, impact your practice. And next slide, please. So those principles addressed um, Again, later on in the presentation, we'll go into in depth about it, but I just wanted to make mention to those six trauma-informed care principles, which are safety, choice, collaboration, empowerment, trustworthiness, and predictability. Next slide, please. All right, so as we jump into the presentation, I first wanna make sure that we are all understanding what we are, um, looking to be considered a trauma. So I pulled this definition from the SAMHSA website and it identifies trauma as an event, a series of events or a, or a set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. Next slide, please. And so when we look at what makes an experience traumatic, um, we first recognize that it's how that individual um, perceives that trauma to be uh, or that experience to be. And so it could either be real or a perceived threat. Um, and it oftentimes result in a person feeling intense feelings of a fear and or a lack of control in that situation. Um, it ultimately changes the way a person may view themselves, others, and just the world around them as a result of experiencing that traumatic event. Um, just some common trauma um, events that are often talked about, you know, domestic situations of domestic violence, um, the death of a loved one or a chronic health condition, and also uh, childhood trauma. Um, 
I, I when, when talking about this, I often go into briefly uh, my own kind of trauma history where even just us working as service providers, um, I got in a car accident one day in the field and to this day, and that was a couple of years ago, to this day, I still, when I'm on the freeway, I still feel the effects of that traumatic event where I get very tense when I'm driving. Um, and it took me a while to kind of work through that, um, to the point where I was you know, able to kind of be okay when driving on the freeway, but that's just the effects of just a traumatic event. It, it often affects us in ways that are unpredictable and unexpected, and it's the response, how our body responds is oftentimes out of our control and can have lifelong um, lasting impact. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. And so in working with um, individuals who have a trauma history, I've often, often found that it's um, helpful to go backwards in order to help that client move forward. And so what I mean by that is being able to understand the root and the cause um, or the issues that's impacting um, my client's health and or their behavior. Um, I found it's very pertinent to being able to understand how um, we as a team or me individually can best treat um, or assist them in that moment. And so, uh, this study called the ACES study, Adverse Childhood Experiences, really kind of sh sh shined a light on um, childhood traumatic experiences that impacted um, participants in this study who were adults, impacted their current health conditions. And so um, this study was conducted in uh, 1995 um, by Dr. Salidi and Onda with Kaiser Permanente and the center of um, the CDC Center for Disease and Control. And so the study was a weight loss study that included over 17,000 participants. Um, and so the basis of the study, Dr. Felidi and Anda wanted to see that the current health conditions that the participants um, and the clients were, the, the participants were experiencing in the study, if there was any um, adverse childhood experiences that impacted that. And so um, what they actually came up with the, the, the results of the study kind of a happenstance. So what they did was at the result, at the end of the study, they started to interview some of the participants to see what kind of contributed to their success in the program. And there was this one lady that Dr. Felitti interviewed um, and she was a successful participant in the program in which she had lost over a um, hundred pounds within the a year of that program. And so Dr. Felitti really wanted to figure out what really contributed to her success and what regimen did she follow and um, just really what helped her succeed in the program. And, and so he got that information from her. And then a couple months later, he um, re-interviewed her and found out that she began to lose a lot of the weight. She began to gain, sorry, a lot of the weight back very rapidly. And so Dr. Felitti was wondering kind of what happened? What did you change your, your regimen plan? What happened that you now seem to kind of be gaining that weight that you had lost. And um, this participant, she had stated that, um, you know, initially when she lost all the weight and she felt very accomplished and her family and friends were commenting and complimenting her on her success in the program, but she received this one compliment from a coworker um, that she had perceived to be a sexual harassment um, comment. And it triggered her and reminded her about a situation in her childhood where in which she was molested by her grandfather. Um, her coping mechanism back then after suffering that traumatic experience was to um, eat. And so she began, when she received this comment from her coworker, she resorted right back to that same coping mechanism and began to um, closet eat again, um, thus resulting in her um, gaining her weight rapidly back. And so this kind of was an aha light bulb moment for Dr. Salidi and Anda, and they wondered if any of the other participants in the program who were struggling with these um, current health conditions in their adulthood had also experienced some type of adverse, adverse childhood um, trauma event. Next slide, please. And so the different adverse childhood experiences that they identified and began to um, send out a survey to participants to see if they identify with anything on this list um, was abuse, suffering any type of emotional, physical, sexual, verbal abuse um, before the age of 18, um, neglect, emotional or physical, um, any type of domestic violence in the home. Um, we know just not mothers of victims of domestic violence, but sometimes often fathers can be victims of domestic violence as well, or any other household challenges um, that kind of stem from 
heavy substance or alcohol abuse in the home, um, one or both parents being incarcerated, if there was any type of chronic mental illness, um, or if a parent was out of the home either due to being incarcerate, incarcerated or a separation or divorce in the family. Um, these were all categories that were identified by some of the participants, majority of the participants in the program um, as childhood experiences that they um, have encountered. Uh, next slide, please. And so as they continue to get um, these, these results of the survey back from participants, um, they began to kind of categorize the different results that they received. Um, and they found that um, if a person um, had received or experienced four or more of those um, adverse childhood experiences, um, they were more than likely um, to have suffered currently some type of chronic health condition or behavior um, issue that's impacting their life today. And so some examples of those um, challenges are a person who did experience four or more ACEs was 12 times more likely to attempt suicide sometime in their life. They were 10 times more likely to struggle with substance abuse um, or seven times more likely to um, have challenges with alcohol. Some of the health conditions that were identified a person was five times more likely to suffer from some type of depression, um, lifelong depression, or um, we can jump down to the last bullet point, which more directly impacts the clients that we serve. Um, if they had the four or more ACEs score, they were um, more than four times more likely to be diagnosed with um, Alzheimer's or some form of dementia. Uh, so next slide, please. And so as this study became more widespread, um, other researchers began to look at that it's just not the adverse childhood experiences that impact a person, but it's also kind of the lifelong or um, challenges or trauma um, experiences that a person may as well experience in their adulthood. Um, and so when we look at this list, um, we see that it talks about at the bottom of the tree, the diagram, um, a person who um, grew up maybe in a poverty stricken community um, that is identified as being a form of a trauma, um, experienced some type of discrimination, um, a lack of opportunity to accessing um, appropriate medical care or economic assistance, um, poor housing or affordable housing, um, as well as growing up in communities where there's a lot of violence. Um, and then if we look to the, di the, the list on the, on the left or the right, um, we also see situations such as experiencing a war, going, you know, being involved in a war, um, our internment camps, the, the discrimination, any type of natural disasters, and then the issues with historical and generational trauma. And so when we think about this list and how many of the clients that we serve, um, our older adult clients who grew up in areas, um, poverty stricken areas, um, experienced discrimination, um, experienced any of these challenges and traumas on this list, um, how it directly impacts them. Um, and it could be a situation where it didn't necessarily, they didn't experience the act of discrimination, but maybe their parents did, and it had this generational trauma um, impact or effect. Um, and I, I think about even if it's the cultural um, history of a lot, the history of trauma with a lot of our um, persons of color, um, specifically for myself, just thinking about the African American community, and the chances are that many of them have not even addressed the trauma that they had experienced or identified it as a trauma in their childhood and growing up in situations of poverty or a lot of violence and unfortunately did not address those um, traumatic experience and us as providers now we're kind of seeing the the, the manifestation of unaddressed trauma and having to help them um, you know work through um, those traumatic experiences so next slide please So this is just gonna be a quick, um, you can put your, your answers in the chat box if you want, but I'm wondering if anybody, um, if you all are familiar with the um, images on here and can call out what these images represent.
Um, doesn't look like we have any answers yet, but if you want to um, come back, we can. Sure, no problem. So yeah. I can just, I can, I can call them out. Um, and so the one um, experience on the left, that is actually um, the Japanese internment camp. Um, so it was persons of Japanese descent who arrived at the Santa Anita Assembly Center in San Pedro. Um, the, the image in the middle is two young ladies who were um, infected with smallpox. And then we have our image on the right, which is the internment camp. And so a lot of the clients you know, that we may serve have either directly or indirectly been impacted by historical trauma um, such as these. And um, again, as we as providers are um, seeing some of those impacts of unaddressed um, trauma with our clients. And uh, Sheree, it looks like we did get some answers and some people were correct, so. Oh, perfect, thank you, thank you. All right, so next slide, please. So I'm briefly just gonna mention this in the handouts that we um, submitted or provided for you guys um, on get your own free will. And if, if you like to do so, this is the ACES questionnaire that is utilized and it's um, a way for you to, um, you could implement it with your work with your clients and or do it for yourself if you're curious to know where you fall on the ACES score. Okay, next slide, please. And so next I'm gonna turn it over to my Ika who is going to um, talk about the impact of elder abuse. Next slide, please. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, we're going to talk about the impact of elder abuse. And first, um, before we talk about the impact, it, we want to discuss the types and just go over them briefly. Um, so starting with physical abuse, financial abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, and self-neglect. And basically, the physical abuse is what it sounds uh, like, but it's also important to think about other things that people would not assume would be physical abuse, as in if someone is being chemically restrained, so over-medicating them, so they're unaware of what's going on or unable to get up and move around. And then financial abuse, anyone who is um, taking someone's money, property, or assets with the intent to defraud them. And emotional abuse, which includes verbal abuse, um, yelling, um, name calling, or making demeaning comments um, towards someone, to name a few. And psychological abuse also uh, it can go under that, which is uh, that manipulative behavior um, and can look like phrases as in people saying, uh, you made me do this or this is your fault. Um, and so, and then sexual abuse uh, can be anywhere from um, um, uh, sexual harassment um, with language, inappropriate language to sexual assault. And then neglect, we see that is when there is someone who is the caregiver who is not providing for that person's basic needs. And with self-neglect, it is the absence of a caregiver um, where that person is unable to provide for their own basic needs, um, not going to the doctor, um, not taking care of themselves um, in multiple capacities. And so those are the types um, of abuse. And so let's talk about the impact. Next slide, please. And so when you think about the types of abuse, um, any and all of those things that people are experiencing um, in regards to abuse um, could result in trauma. And that's one of the biggest um, impacts and it doesn't mean that they would have to go through years and years of abuse to um to have trauma it could just be even one incident uh, and then also stress comes into play with that so someone who um is uh, living with an abuser or in an abusive environment um, 
who has to face uh, that type of abuse every day could be under a lot of stress and because their home environment or their environment is unpredictable and they don't know what to expect. And then there's a lot of shame and embarrassment that also goes along with that because they, they are um, ashamed they're in this position, they don't want other people to know, um, and a lot of uh, self-isolation can happen because they are trying to hide that shame and embarrassment from others. And then we also see a lot of fear coming out of this, fear of the abuser, of course, but also fear of other things, right? And it could be because the abuser is telling them you could get deported if you say something, um, or um, you could be removed from this home. You, you, the abuser could be saying you're gonna go uh, have to go into a facility or a nursing home if you tell anyone, um, which is one of the biggest fears of our older adults is they really want to, to stay in their home. Uh, and then what also is interesting about our older adults is they also don't want um, consequences necessarily to the abuser. They more likely want the abusive behavior to stop and for that person to get help. And then lastly, there's this real feeling of being overwhelmed, especially if you think of someone who's already self-isolating because they're ashamed, they're embarrassed. Um, and if they're not reaching out um, to their social supports, they could feel extremely overwhelmed and stuck, really, um, when they're in this situation. And we've also seen with the domestic violence types of situations um, and family violence that there can be traumatic bonding um, where they, they do love the person but also resent being in this situation. Next slide, please. And so next we're gonna talk um, a little bit about trauma and the brain. First, how we respond, um, and then what it looks like for, for how the brain responds. Next slide, please. And so um, when we are in danger or there's this sense of emergency, there are four instinctive survival responses. We have fight, flight, freeze, and appease. And I'm sure you may have heard of these before. And so um, what um, some people's instinct might be to freeze because, you know, we're just trying to wrap our brains around what is actually happening, um, figuring it out. Uh, and then next, we're probably going to figure out, uh, is there a high probability for survival? Are we going to run? you know, which is flight, or are we gonna stay in and fight? And then then there's the peas. And so um, someone, if they may feel their probability of survival is low, may turn to a peas. They may surrender, or if it's domestic violence, they may um, try to go along with what the abuser is saying for survival. And with the peas, um, there is a syndrome called Stockholm syndrome, which um, came about due to a uh, bank robbery in Stockholm, Sweden, where the uh, robbers took hostages and they um, uh, afterwards, because they, they took hostages for a while, afterwards, they, people were surprised that the hostages sided with the bank robbers. And instead of having anger, um, they they felt for them. And so we can see this, that's how the syndrome, the Stockholm syndrome came to be, but we also see this with domestic violence situations where um, the victim uh, sometimes uh, sides with the abuser and then we have that traumatic bonding uh, that we talked about earlier. Next slide, please. And so having talked about how we react in an emergency or if we're in danger, um, it's also important to look at um, what would happen if we um, develop PTSD, if we are constantly in a dangerous situation, um, post-traumatic stress disorder could develop. And what does that look like in the brain? So we've seen the effects of PTSD um, on the brain through neuroimaging and we've seen that 
of the amygdala is involved in recognizing both conditioned and unconditioned stimuli, signaling danger, as well as expressing that fear response. And so when we look at PTSD, um, it's been noted that the amygdala reactivity is exaggerated in individuals with PTSD, and it's positively correlated with symptom severity. And so what's important to note is that um, if we can see that our brain is reacting this way um, when we're in a dangerous situation, it's also reacting this way if we are experiencing symptoms from PTSD. And when we are experiencing these things, um, this sense of danger, cortisol is being released. And so if someone is continuously um, in a dangerous situation like domestic violence, we see that every day, or if they're being triggered through PTSD, cortisol can continually be released in the body, which could have adverse health effects on us as well as um, could make the brain become predisposed to be in this constant state of fight or flight, um, which sometimes you can see with people with PTSD having this sense of what Sri was uh, saying earlier, a real or perceived danger. Next slide, please. And this is just a reminder for us. A study was done in regards to um, PTSD and elder abuse and showed a strong relationship between the two. And so this is just a reminder for those of us who, you know, work with abuse victims, making sure that we are aware when the symptoms of PTSD are showing up and then that we assess for that um, so that we can make sure that we're um, reacting appropriately and helping our uh, our clients appropriately. Next slide, please. And so this is one of the case examples I'm going to discuss, and um, her name has been changed, of course, but we will call her Jan. And she uh, is a 68-year-old female. She was married for over 20 years, and throughout her marriage, she experienced verbal and physical abuse from her spouse. Um, how this came to be was that her, that it got, um, that we became aware of it and that law enforcement became aware of it is because her spouse choked her and um, the police were called. She did call them and he ended up, her spouse ended up being arrested. And at that time, an emergency protective order was issued to her. So she, it was a week long restraining order. Um, and at that time, she was given resources uh, about getting a more permanent type of restraining order going to court. Um, and then she was asked if she wanted to stay in the home or go to a shelter. Um, and she decided to move in with her daughter, which also lived in the same city, just temporarily to figure out what she would do. And she was also referred to uh, counseling. And so I ended up getting the referral for counseling. Next slide, please. And I was able to uh, see Jan individually, and she was also able to join uh, one of our empowerment groups for support, where we talk about um, and we educate victims on abuse types, um, healthy relationships and unhealthy um, and so during that time, she also sought a temporary restraining order, which um, was in place for three weeks and was starting to feel empowered, starting to have um, understand that she did not need to stay in this type of uh, abusive situation. But also during this time, her spouse was in jail and started to have health issues and he um, was sent to the hospital to be treated. And once treated, the hospital called um, Jan and told her he was doing better. She would have to come pick him up. Now, there was a communication gap here where the um, hospital did not know about the restraining order and they were not told about it. And so this was a pivotal moment for Jan. 
because she came into my office and told me, yes, the hospital called. They said I needed to pick up my husband. And I did have a moment where I thought, oh no, she went to pick him up. <laughs> she And she told me, well, no, I actually told the hospital um, that there's a restraining order and I would not be able to, we, we cannot live in the same home and I could not pick him up. And what it showed to me and what she did say was she felt empowered. She felt supported through her through the group members and she felt like she could actually um, use her voice and decline to get her spouse. And so he ended up going to a board and care and she um, continued on in counseling, but her spouse's health declined in the board and care and he ended up passing away. And so she continued on, we did grief counseling um, during that time and also um, she also found housing and ended up moving into the same apartment complex as her, her daughter. Um, and what this case um, shows us is that throughout her life, she used the, one of those four survival instincts she used to peace. Um, but through, uh, through the work that she did and getting help and seeking help, um, counseling groups and all of that, she was able to uh, feel empowered enough to, to find her voice and protect herself. Next slide, please. And what did we learn from that in regards to um, the principles of trauma-informed care? Um, what was important to note in that is that safety was used with that case example. Um, she was um, given that emergency protective order um, from the start. Um, she was also given choice, what, you know, asked what she would like to do because she was given the shelter uh, as an option. And then the collaboration that um, happened because there was a warm handoff through the referrals, through law enforcement, um, to my agency. And then um, through her groups, she felt empowered. And then she also, um, it, you can kind of see all of these principles were used. The trustworthiness and predictability, I think, came from her being able to know that she could count on um, the people who were providing services to her. Next slide, please. And going back to talking a little bit about trauma memory, and, and um, it's important to note that, um, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of ideas out there about trauma memory. But what we do know is that um, trauma memories can be like puzzle pieces. And sometimes there could be bits of information that are very clear and in focus. And there are other bits of information that can be a bit jumbled. And so how do we help individuals who, who have this type of trauma memory? Well, what does help is um, to create this coherent narrative. So for them to be able to process the memory, whether it be through going to a group of survivors who've been through the same thing like them or going to um, individual counseling um, or having just some sort of uh, support, but being able to process it can help people to come to understand um, what has happened to them and make sense of it. Next slide, please. And so I just want to uh, briefly remind you again that traumatic situations will be discussed during this training um, and that if you need to take care of yourself um, and step away, please do that. Uh, and at this time, I'm going to go to the next slide and there will be some audio played for you. Thank you. What we have been fearing uh, for the longest time here apparently has come to pass, a disastrous terrorist attack on the World Trade Center, both towers, planes smashing into each one. What we have... Thank you. And so, obviously, you heard that. That was a newscast from 9-11. Uh, 
and um, you see the picture. And so why we played that is because this was something that we all went through as a nation, which was extremely traumatic, um, whether you were on the East Coast or the West Coast. And um, we want to move um, and, and launch another poll because we just want to hear from you. We want to know if you can remember where you were uh, on that day. And so if you don't mind taking this next poll, please. Oh, and it looks like there's something wrong with our polls right now. Um, the next one we had was about COVID-19 impacting older adults. Oh, okay. Um, no problem. So, um, or if you can please put in um, any in the chat, let us know if you can remember uh, where you were um, on this day. I know for me, I remember exactly where I was and what I was doing when this uh, when this happened, which was just getting ready um, ready for work, right? And some of you were getting ready for work. Some of you may have been in school. Um, yeah, you know, some folks are saying getting ready for class, on my way to work, okay. at home. Um, other people okay. were in high school at the time. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you, for responding. And so why I asked that question was because the way you can remember um, exactly where you were, that's how trauma memory works. That's how when somebody says, um, you know, they've been through this traumatic experience, they can remember some things, but not everything. That's how it works, trauma memory. Next slide, please. And next slide. And so when this happened, there was actually a study done to um, measure um, how people responded to 9-11 and to see if those who were indirectly um, exposed to it developed um, PTSD symptoms. And so um, this study was launched online. They sent over 3,000 surveys out. They had 2,729 people respond. And they did four waves of testing. And this was, um, they did the first wave of testing two weeks after 9-11, then three weeks, then two months, and then six months. And so what they found was that um, even though there were people who were indirectly exposed to 9-11, they did not actually develop PTSD, but they still saw similar stress responses um, in people who have PTSD. And so um, they were able to say that there were still low level stress responses in those people um, who were indirectly exposed to 9-11. Next slide. And so when we talk about, we talk about um, that and then we also can move into COVID-19 because this is also something we're experiencing as a nation um, and um, people will see probably um, in the future who um, had traumatic experiences because of this. We, with older adults, uh, there are some things that we've seen already, which is this increased um, fear, and you know they are one of the most vulnerable groups in regards to COVID-19, um, but also fear of not getting their basic needs met. Um, when all, all of this started, we know grocery stores, um, the shelves were emptied, right? And so there was a lot of food insecurity. Um, and then we have isolation because we're telling everyone to stay home and then our seniors who were able to go out. I don't know about in your areas, but in our areas, the senior centers were a, like a lifeline and some people would also get their one meal a day there were closed. And so that was another huge stressor on our older adults. So they're dealing with stress and anxiety and also um, and this is not something we have proof of yet, but if they are living in abusive situations, are those situations even being reported? 
um, right now. So next slide, please. Uh, and is this a poll you'd be able to launch? It is indeed. I will launch this okay. poll right now. You'll see the same question that um, was on the slide just a minute ago. And this is one where you can click all that apply. Um, and it is up on your screen right now if you want to click any of these. In what ways has COVID-19 impacted your work with older adults? And you can select um, one or more or all of these um, options. And we'll leave this up for oh, about 15 more seconds to give everyone a chance to vote. Um, and again, you can vote by clicking directly on your screen and you can vote for more than one of these. All right, we'll close this out in about five seconds and then share the results. All right, I'm closing that out now and I will share those results. It looks like um, the first one, working remotely with clients, was endorsed the highest than using more technology for services and resources, followed by the last one, difficulty connecting with clients over phone or Zoom, and then more of a need to get basic needs met in last place. But all of these were answered quite a bit. So. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you all for, for taking that poll. Yes, you know, we have seen the same. And so it sounds like we're all experiencing some of these same things with really trying to stay connected to our, um, our older adults, but then having um, these other um, issues of trying to make sure that we can meet their needs, but then um, technology being an issue, working remotely also being an issue. Uh, so, and I'm sure we'll continue to see the effects of that. Thank you so much. Next slide, please. And um, so, I also want to talk about um, how our clients respond to trauma, how we respond to trauma. And so, um, when we look at um, trauma responses, um, most of the time, that's just the, the way the person is able to cope. It's their best attempt at um, coping with an overwhelming experience. And so some of these responses can be positive and, and sometimes not. Sometimes they can be maladaptive. And so what we've seen is that um, when, when they're maladaptive, um, a lot of times people still feel like it's, it's an okay solution to the problem, even though we, maybe as the service providers, see it as a problem. And so some examples of, of a um, maladaptive solution or way to deal with it is self-medicating. So um, someone who is drinking or gambling or even social withdrawal. Uh, and we have a case example that's coming up next that I'm going to, um, um, Sheree is going to discuss. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this is a case that um, I had prior to uh, being trauma informed. Um, and so, uh, just keep that in mind as we kind of go through it, and then I can then discuss um, my experience with a, a trauma-informed lens. And so this is um, a client who we'll call Mary, um, who, 67-year-old female who was living alone. She did have two adult children, but um, was not in contact with them and had not been for several years. Um, and she was a reported victim of uh, 26 APS reports within a two-year span. And um, all of these reports were alleging um, financial abuse. And so myself, um, Adult Protective Services, as well as law enforcement and FBI, we went out um, to provide services and assistance to the client. And so um, in our initial home visit, um, just kind of sit and sit down with the client and discuss some of the um, allegations regarding the financial abuse and just kind of ask the client, you know, uh, we're getting these reports that um, you've um, lost or um, wired over $500,000 um, overseas. And so, of course, to us, uh, many of us as providers, I'm sure as soon as we hear a client um, wiring money overseas, we red flags go up and we automatically know that this was some type of romance scam. And so, I asked the client, you know, who are you wiring the money to? Who's the stranger you're wiring this money to? And she stated, well, it's not a stranger to me. He's my fiance. And so as a service providers, you know, I was just like, okay, it was really, um, 
I think I probably had received five um, romance scam cases um, within this month. So it was like, okay, here we go again. Um, and so kind of feeling like already defeated in the situations because these are very challenging cases to um, provide assistance for with clients because um, it's often met with a lot of resistance. And so this case um, wasn't any different from what expected and just kind of talked to the client through it. And she had told me that um, this individual, she he had reached out to her via Facebook and um, they were friends and just got to get to know each other and quickly it turned into a romantic relationship. And um, he had made all these promises to come visit, visit her. Um, and she, anytime he was supposed to come out automatically, he had some um, crisis that he needed financial assistance to get. Through. So he was working on an oil rig. And again, we're very familiar with how these romance scams go. So he was working on an oil rig and there was this uh, major explosion on the oil rig. So now he's in the hospital and he needs uh, $10,000 to cover his medical bills or else the, the hospital's not gonna release him. And um, there was a time he was supposed to come out and see her, another time he was supposed to come out and see her, but um, he had experienced another financial crisis and needed more money um, to get out of this crisis before he can come see her. And so um, this just, again, went on for two years and this client just continued to wire him money and there was nothing we could do as service providers to convince her um, otherwise that you're not in a relationship with this person, although you are communicating with somebody, um, it's not a real relationship and she just was not um, receiving that. And so um, adult protective services, they were in and out because we know a lot of times um, you guys are, you know, there's time restrictions for a lot of agencies, um, but my involvement was a little longer, but eventually the client um, not lacking any capacity. So having the right to make the decisions and do what she wanted with our finances, um, we all had to kind of close our cases. Um, and so, a couple of months had um, passed and I just called the client just to check on her to see how things were going. And she ended up telling me, you know, at some point I, I realized that this wasn't a real relationship, but what I didn't tell you um, when I first kind of met you all um, was that I had been married for 26 years. And of those 26 years, uh, 23 of those years, I was a victim of domestic violence by my ex-husband. Um, and my children, um, because I refused to um, divorce my husband, they had stated that they didn't, didn't want to see me um, die or continue to suffer in this uh, relationship dynamic, in this marriage. And so um, they had severed all contact called highs with her. Um, and so she was suffering from loneliness and abandonment. And she said, and this was the first time that somebody paid attention to me in that way. And it was my way of fulfilling my need of loneliness um, and having that intimacy without the physical threat of being beaten every night. And so just hearing her say that, my, my heart automatically broke. I, my eyes were, I was tearful. I was just like, wow, like I didn't even think of it that way. And as my could just, talked about in the previous slide, what we see as um, our clients, what a, a problem may very well be our client's way of coping with the trauma that they experience. And this was her way of getting her needs met um, and still feeling safe. And so this was just really eye-opening um, for me as a service provider and then receiving this trauma-informed care training. Um, it just really helped me connect the dots and, and how um, I, provided services and care to clients who may be experiencing some type of trauma that um, I'm not aware of as a provider and going in there with a different lens. Um, so next slide, please. So the different uh, trauma-informed care principles had I been aware during the time that could have been implemented, um, you know, safety. So us as providers automatically were concerned with the clients. Um, I was concerned with her financial safety. Um, and making sure, I mean, she had, you know, $500,000 to transfer, so she wasn't in a dire need of, um, you know, financial care and security, but at some point, you know, people run out of money, so it was making sure that the money that she did have, that she would have that to sustain her for the rest of her life, so that was um, our goal as service providers, but kind of unbeknownst to us, the client was ensuring her own um, parameters of safety, um, because she was able to have this relationship um, via um, internet without um, 
the fear of safety of this individual coming home every night and physically hurting her. And so again, this was only um, learned through further assessing and asking the right questions to the client. Um, the choice principle could have also been applied. Um, again, um, we will, the client did have capacity, so just allowing, you know, ultimately her the, the, the right to make the decisions that she wanted to make. Um, and so our attempt in trying to empower her and making those choices was to provide her with the education that we knew as providers about romance scams and kind of how, how they happen, how they play out and what you can do to kind of safeguard yourself. We had um, even um, told her about, um, talking to her about blocking her, her social media and just different ways um, to safeguard her account. Um, but she, you know, ultimately shows that she did not want to do that. And again, she had capacity, so she had that right to make that, that choice. Um, collaboration with uh, myself, Adult Protective Services and law enforcement um, with this case, that was um, very evident throughout the whole case, um, our time in working with the client. Um, and then trustworthiness. Um, she eventually did, I, I felt, um, there was had to have been some type of report that was established with her um, for her to ultimately share um, what was really kind of going on behind the mask of um, that she was experiencing as the trauma that she was experiencing. So um, there was some report that was established and then just predictability. Um, we're, we're very keen on making sure that when we tell clients we are going to do something or be somewhere or schedule an appointment that we follow through. Um, and so predictability is always very um, important to implement in working with our clients. So I'm going to turn it back over to Maika. Next slide, please. Thank you, Sheree. Uh, and so um, when we're talking about trauma, um, one of the biggest impacts is feeling unsafe. And so how does that manifest? And so it can manifest with people withdrawing. Uh, physically and emotionally. Um, it can uh, come out as aggression. Uh, it could also look like fear of intimacy, which could lead to those self-sabotaging behaviors, like as in sabotaging their relationships and pushing people away. Uh, it could also be the self-medication I talked about earlier, which could lead to dependency or even addiction. Next slide, please. And um, self-neglect, how does that play out in response to trauma? Um, so it could look like physical neglect where someone is not eating correctly, going or even going for checkups at their doctor or taking their medications. It could look like poor hygiene. Um, and then it also could be um, medical neglect, as I just said. Um, and then self-injurious behaviors like cutting, as well as isolation. Next slide, please. Um, and so what we've also found is that in regards to trauma, not everyone um, who goes through a trauma um, develops trauma-related issues. And why is that? Well, resiliency is is why. and, and the definition of resilience is the ability to move forward despite um, uh, your circumstance, um, and in this case, despite traumatic events. And so um, we're going to take a look at that as well as um, some four key areas. Uh, so next slide. The um, what keeps us resilient? And so one huge thing that keeps us uh, resilient is having social connections. So being connected to friends or family um, helps to keep us resilient and having those emotional connections. Sleep uh, is also um, a huge, a huge thing about keeping us resilient because when we don't have our sleep, we are, um, well, not just grumpy, <laughs> but also we can't focus, right? We can't concentrate, um, we're not present. And then um, exercising and staying active, those things also fall in line with just making sure we're keeping ourselves healthy, even though it sounds easy and we've all heard this before, exercising and staying active 
can also help us to cope better with stressful situations um, and help us to maintain our resiliency. And then avoiding self-blame. And so we've seen those people who are able to recognize that they are not the problem, they are not why this situation has occurred, are better able to move forward. And then maintaining this positive outlook. So someone who can see the glass half full instead of the glass half empty, we've seen that is another, um, another way that people can um, remain resilient. And next slide, please. And so this is the Deborah O'Dell Resiliency Survey, um, which is otherwise known as DARS by Mary McCrane. And this is one of your handouts. And so you can um, um, look at it, take it yourself or give it to clients. It's something that we use as well as a strength-based tool. Um, and it would it's broken up into four sections and it actually can show where people's resiliency lies. And so it goes, one section is relationships, the other one is internal beliefs, the other one is initiative, and the last is self-control. So this <clears throat> can be used to basically say, look, oh, wow, you're extremely, um, this is a strength for you. You've been extremely resilient in these areas and to continue to help them to build um, other areas of resiliency. Next slide, please. And so what happens, um, you know, uh, we all have that um, area, our resiliency zone, so to speak, but anyone can get bumped out of it, right? We're coasting along, life is great, and then something happens. And so when you're bumped out of your resiliency, it can look like hyper arousal or hypo arousal and the hyper arousal it uh, could manifest as hyperactivity mania anxiety or panic uh, and or rage and hypo arousal could look like um, depression feeling disconnected exhaustion or fatigue uh, as well as uh, feeling numb and so when people feel numb they're pushing those feelings down um, so they don't have to face them, they don't have to feel them. Next slide, please. And when we talk about um, getting bumped out, um, the, the, one of the ways to be able to recover is to be able to self-regulate. And so not everyone who's gone through trauma has the ability to be able to self regulate. And so um, I'm sure you may have seen this with clients or people you run into, they're triggered and um, they're unable to calm themselves down. And so what this looks like, the very first picture on the uh, left, that could be someone with little or no trauma. You know, they're going along in, in life and they have their path laid out for them. Um, the path looks free and clear. Right, they can they can see their goals in sight, and to the right of that you have a picture of someone who possibly has trauma history. They could have the same path, but it could look um, very uh, scary. It could look like there's things in the way, like they're unable to reach their goals, and they're uh, unsure how to move past these issues that could come up. Next slide, please. <clears throat> And then you have someone with severe trauma, so on the right side, where they could be stuck, just like this uh, boat that's capsized. They could have, um, when they're thrown off of their resiliency zone and they're bumped out, um, they may be unable to self-regulate, unable to calm themselves down, and um, really, really have issues um, in regards to communicating and getting help. Next slide, please. And so now we're going, we're going to continue to talk about um, practical um, tips, but before we do that, um, Sheree is going to discuss secondary trauma. Okay. Next slide, please. So as service providers, we um, are, um, can be exposed to what we call secondary trauma, um, and it's 
basically witnessing the event or its aftermath of as a first responder and or hearing the very um, detailed um, experiences of our clients who suffered a traumatic event. And, you know, oftentimes this is a part of our, our role as service providers where we um, are assessing um, the issues or the, the situations that um, or had impacted our clients, if older adult uh, services, there's obviously an abuse situation that was reported. And so we hear those details from clients of what um, happened during that traumatic event. Um, and we learn that um, we can also be exposed to trauma either by in our personal lives by friends or family. Um, so it could be a direct or an indirect, indirect um, impact um, that we've experienced. Um, and so our own personal histories with trauma are, can sometimes be reawakened by um, the, the exposure um, in working with our clients. And so um, I refer back to the, the example that I discussed with Mary and the um, romance scams. Um, I remember during this time, like I said, I, I had a lot of clients on my caseload who were experiencing either like the romance scams or the grandparent scams. And my own grandparents had just, um, almost fallen victim to a grandparent scam and wired some money to an individual. Um, and so I became very hypervigilant hyper and telling my grandparents all the things that they needed to do um, to protect themselves, change their number, doing all these different things. And so in, again, in my own work, um, being exposed to that with clients became very hypervigilant in my personal life. Um, and so, uh, so there was a study that was found that between 40 and 85% of helping professionals develop some type of vicarious trauma, um, experience compassion fatigue and or high rates of traumatic symptoms um, as a result of their work with working with clients um, who have a tra trauma history. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Hello? Thank you. <laughs> All right, so when we look at compassion fatigue, how many of our desks or cars um, as service providers have looked like uh, the picture on the screen? Uh oh, are we there we go, there we go. Um, and so um, when we do experience comp compassion fatigue, um, what that could look like is just the physical and emotional exhaustion of um, our duties or responsibilities on the job. Um, oftentimes we can become dissociated with the work that we're doing and um, everything can become just kind of mundane and we're just kind of going through the motions um, with working with clients and driving to see clients. All of that's just uh, physically and emotionally exhausting at times. Um, chronic physical symptoms that we can experience. Um, ourselves getting, um, having issues with um, our own physical health. Um, headaches, migraines throughout the day, um, all of these can just kind of be um, a, a symptom of the compassion fatigue that we experience with um, working with clients with trauma, um, as well as our reduced ability to feel sympathy or, or empathy um, towards situations with clients. Um, again, I revert back to that case where I had so many romance scams and I, I had to sit back and realize that I was, whenever I got a romance scam case, I would kind of already go in it um, with the mentality of, I already know the client's gonna be very resistant. There's nothing that's gonna be done with this case and just feeling, like I said, very hopeless, um, even before I even met the client, just because of the history of working with um, previous romance scam cases. And so we need to really be aware as service providers that um, we keep this kind of in check. And, and if we are experiencing this, recognizing that it is a symptom of compassion fatigue and it's very normal as service providers, but it's something if we're experiencing, we do need to get help um, to address. Um, it can also decrease our sense of enjoyment in our in the work that we do. Um, oftentimes just having very large caseloads and all of this. Um, there's so many different layers. And now with you know the the different um, restrictions with the COVID-19 shutdown and a lot of our agencies, um, it can just all become very overwhelming. And sometimes we can just lose interest in doing the work that we um, once you know enjoyed. And then also being aware of our own um, susceptibility to um, using drugs and alcohol to kind of help us cope through um, the stress of our everyday lives. Um, 
Maitha is going to talk a little bit about things that we do for self-care and you know a lot of um, when we do this presentation a lot of people identify as one of their self-care tools they like to go home and have a glass of wine and there's nothing at all wrong with it I do that too but we just want to be very conscious to make sure that that glass of wine doesn't turn into a couple of bottles a night and so um, if it does again obviously that's something we need to receive help for but recognizing that that is a symptom of compassion fatigue and when we're experiencing that, we do need to get the assistance to kind of work through that. The so next slide, please. Um, are you able to launch this poll, Andrew? I can indeed, and this is, um, I will we'll launch this right now. This is a very easy one. It's a binary, yes or no. Have you experienced stress, compassion, fatigue, or burnout due to the nature of your work? And with so many APS folks in our audience, I am sure it's gonna be a very high yes without even looking at the responses, um, but everyone can vote for yes or no by clicking on your screen. Let us know if you've ever experienced stress, compassion, fatigue, or burnout due to the nature of your work. We'll leave this up for just a few more seconds to give folks a chance to respond. I was an APS worker myself, so I'm not going experience <laughs> some, definitely experienced some compassion fatigue, certainly, right. like every APS worker has. I will, um, close that poll out and launch the results right now and it looks like 93 percent of wow. folks that responded said yes that they did and a small seven percent said no wow yeah definitely not surprising but surprising you know at the same time that you know we, we all experience uh, majority of us you know experience some type of compassion fatigue in our work so we recognize that it's very normal but it's something that impacts the majority of us so really something for us to be aware about um, I am going to turn it over to my I see we have about 15 minutes left in the presentation, so we want to make sure you guys get the um, ways to um, implement trauma-informed care. So next slide, please. Thank you, Cherie. And so um, talking about preventing burnout, um, just knowing like what Cherie said, it is normal and cat compassion fatigue can lead to burnout. And so how do we um, how do we prevent that? What do we do? And so um, there are three things to think about for yourselves, um, awareness, balance, and connection. And so just being aware of those signals when you are getting tired, when you are uh, getting overwhelmed in regards to um, you know, the work that you do. Um, and then when you sense that you're feeling that way, um, look at having, making sure you have balance and connection in your lives. And the balance is having that work-life balance and making sure you have self-care um, um, things that you do outside of work. It could also include work, right? It could also be coworkers or you have, you know, um, supervision, you're able to talk about some tough cases. It could be that um, during the day you go for a walk or you meditate or you listen to music, but you also want to make sure you have things you do outside of work that really um, feed your soul, that help you to de-stress. And then the last thing with connection, that's making sure, we talked about resiliency before, and that social supports are really important. It's also about you being connected, you having those social supports, making sure that you're connected to family or friends, um, and to get that emotional support that you might need. And um, this is our last poll, if we have time. We want to see if... Um, there's anything that you actually um, do for uh, self-care and uh, we can launch that for you if we can go to the next slide I will launch that for us right now I um, mean I believe there is one small poll after this um, do you do anything for self-care um, and you can click on the screen by answering it yes um, no but I would like to and then sometimes is another option um, and just like the other polls, click directly on your screen if you would like to vote. We'll leave this up for a few more seconds. All right, I'll leave it up for about five more seconds to give folks an opportunity to vote. All right, I'll close that out and share the results now. And it looks like 62% said yes. 34% said sometimes, and then 4% said no, but they would like to. So vast majority do. Wonderful. Uh, and thank you so much all for doing the poll. Next slide, please. 
Um, we do have this handout for you, which is a self-care wheel, which could give you some ideas if you don't have a routine. Um, it's in you know four different, you know, four or five different areas you have that you can look at. Get some ideas about things that you can incorporate into your regular routine that could help you uh, in regards to self-care. Um, and I believe the you're right, Andrew, the last poll is about what you do, what you actually do for self-care, uh, which is the next uh, one. There we go, and I will launch that for us right now. And this is one where you can um, select one or more options. So you can select all of these or just one of them or two. Um, what do you do for self-care? Do you exercise, take vacation, meditate, read or watch TV, um, or do some sort of arts or be creative? Um, so we'll leave that up for just a few more seconds, about 10 more seconds to give folks a chance to vote. And then in about two more seconds, I'll close that out. All right, and then I'll share the results. Um, it looks like the majority endorsed read, watch TV, um, followed by exercise, um, followed by take vacation, and then arts, be creative, and then 24% meditate. Wonderful, thank you. It's great that we all have these measures and yeah, definitely I'm, I do all the same, right? All of the same things. Um, it's just important to have something that you do. So it's great to see that you all have something that you do for self-care. Um, and so now we're going to move into, um, next slide please, the implications for practice. And um, we're going to look at, um, motivational interviewing as well and so Sheree is going to discuss that next slide please okay so um we in the definition for motivational interviewing as being a a client center directive therapeutic style to enhance the readiness for change um, by helping clients explore and resolve any ambivalence um, and elicit the client's own motivation for change and so um Basically, the key to motivational interviewing is finding something that you can say yes to with your clients. And so what I mean by that is you know, implementing these five principles. Um, first, you want to be able to express the empathy that um, the client is discussing with you through reflective listening means. So the client may be identifying a goal as being um, they want to remain in their home and just kind of maintain or sustain their independence in their home. And so you know, first normalizing, like that's a very normal thing. We, we wanna keep our clients in our home. That's not our goal as um, service providers to take them out. Um, but if we see that there's a need for maybe increased care, um, that maybe the client might wanna consider maybe getting an in-home caregiver or um, transitioning to um, some type of assisted living where they can get that care. Um, and oftentimes that's met with a lot of resistance um, from our clients. So develop discrepancies between the client's goals um, or their values um, and their current behavior. So if the client um, is struggling with uh, maintaining their independence in the home, um, but they're being offered assistance, um, such as maybe getting an in-home caregiver and the client is resistant to that as well, kind of just pointing that out to the client and, and saying, you know, you have this identified goal that you, you've chosen and I'm trying to help you meet that goal and just kind of exploring what some of their resistance or hesitation might be and receiving that in-home care or assistance. Um, one of the big things we want to avoid is getting in any type of um, power struggle with our clients. Um, we know that's in it often just leads to everybody being frustrated, the clients not um, receptive or opening, open to receiving any other resources we may offer. And then us as service providers, you know, um, feeling that we're in all great intentions and trying to meet the needs of clients and we get frustrated because the client is not receptive. So we want to avoid any power struggles and how we're able to do that is again by using the motivational interviewing piece. and finding out what the client's goals are um, for the, the issue that they might be experiencing and how can we help um, provide them with assistance to help meet that goal. Um, and then again, just supporting self-efficacy of the client. Of course, if there's a capacity issue, that's, a, that's another issue where we might need to get more um, service providers in to kind of address um, or fully assess 
um, the client's level of capacity because there are certain levels of capacity, but um, being able to support the client's um, decision making and again, providing them with um, all the information and necessary um, skills that they can utilize to um, meet, help them meet their goals. So the next slide, please. And so it's no surprise when we, we think about the trauma-informed care principles as well as motivational interviewing that there's a lot of similarities between these two concepts. Um, and uh, in helping with clients, where our goal is to you know, be able to strengthen and motivate them and their commitment to change um, in the spirit of motivational interviewing includes uh, acceptance, partnership, and vocation and compassion. Um, and these are just different ways. Um, there's a lot of different correlations um, between the trauma-informed care and motivational interview principles. Um, but this is an example of how these two um, principles can, they kind of correlate and work together in helping the client um, meet their desired goals. So next slide, please. And I'll turn that over to Maika. Yes, and so let's um, practical tips um, with uh, working with our clients. Listening is key. A lot of times, I know um, we have resources and we're we're, we're ready to um, talk to them and give them all the information. But listening is key. Finding out um, um, what they think, what they see as the problem, what they feel like they need um, the most help with, and then letting them set set these goals and, and going from there and then being um, patient and calm I know it's not always easy um, with some um, situations but making sure that you're uh, you have the ability to stay calm and be patient and um, reassure um, the people that you're working with um, that um, you will be able to have that trustworthiness and predictability and they can always contact you um, in for follow-up questions and then focusing on what you can do instead of what you can't and um, you know we have the example of trauma-informed of powering with the client instead of trying to power over them and so really that just means working with them collaborating with them um, um, making sure that you're working together um, and then being transparent about what documentation and or procedures that you um, have to go through first because a lot of times it can be very confusing for clients. Why do I have to answer all these questions? I thought you were going to help me. And so um, just making sure that you're transparent with what you need to do um, first. And um, when I say focus on what you can do instead of what you can't, even using that as your, as your phrase, right? And so um, a lot of times we start off with uh, we can't do this, we can't do that, but hearing them out, listening and saying, okay, I hear you, I hear what you want, and here's what I can do about that. And next slide, please. And then when a client is triggered, so, um, and how do we respond? And so um, most of the time, if a client is really triggered, we can't continue on with whatever goal we had for that meeting. Um, and so we would need to stop, um, appreciate what's actually going on for the client, um, and be empathetic, validate and normalize their experience because what they are experiencing, their feelings are true for, for them. And then um, explore the next step that they are uh, feel comfortable taking. Um, and maybe they're not comfortable at that moment. You might need to um, table whatever conversation um, or goals that you had and reschedule for another time. And so um, helping them to calm down could also look like minimizing the amount of people in the room or getting them to a quiet space. Um, if you have someone who can talk to them a support person um, uh, or um, a therapist to be able to just help them calm down or even refer them um, during that meeting to someone they can talk to after uh, to help them to start develop skills to help them cope um, for when they get triggered. Next slide, please. Uh, and so we are nearing um, the end of our presentation, and so we want you to know that um, we've been trained by ECHO, and this uh, material um, comes from ECHO Parenting. Um, some of the information comes from ECHO. And next slide, please. 
And now we're in the point of our presentation where we would like to offer uh, up to answer any questions that you might have. And so please um, put any in the chat or maybe you can let us know, Andy, if there's already questions. There are quite a few questions already, actually, and we only have a few minutes, so I will jump right in so we can answer a few of those. Um, so the first question, which I thought was very interesting, how would you assess for PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, when a person has dementia and you don't know the person's history? That is a great question, and you're right. Some of our clients do have um, dementia or Alzheimer's and and so that would be the first thing um, really in regards to them getting it treated and and sometimes you know what they're experiencing is where those is their symptoms of um, you know um, dementia are gonna cloud those other areas in regards to the, the PTSD and so um, I think that's that's tricky, but also just knowing that if they're getting triggered, um, that's that's the thing that you can work with, right? Because um, um, the triggers are, are what you wanna make sure that you're noticing and that you're trying to help them in any way, shape or form to deal with, whether that's a, um, there's someone with them, if there's a caregiver that's helping them, or if, um, there's anything that uh, for them feels comfortable um, because even though there's people who um, have you know that diagnosis some are severe more severe than others and there might be things that they feel comfortable that can help calm them down so that could be a start I don't know if anyone else has any I, I wanted to kind of piggyback on that um, what you said Micah and two um, when you are working with clients, just again, depending on the, the stage of um, dementia or Alzheimer's that they have, um, if they do have a support system, that might be a good way to even educate, if it's a, their adult children who are the caregivers, educating them on um, ways to help the client um, kind of minimize those symptoms if they're feeling triggered or an anxiety, um, just educating them on the, the diagnosis so they're able to, um, they're not getting frustrated and triggering the client and the client's triggering them. And so really, if there's a support system that's in place, um, that would be really helpful to try to collaborate and bring them into the conversation as well. Great, excellent advice. Do we have a scale to rate trauma or a tool to rate trauma experiences with elders 60 or 65 plus? Great question. Um, I believe there um, have been um, some attempts to do that. Um, and I've seen a scale, uh, actually one of the NAPSA uh, conferences, there was someone using the scale, but they hadn't actually um, copyrighted and sent it out. Um, because, but what was interesting about it, and I can kind of give you some of the, the, the instances, is they're looking at um, ACEs, as well as other um, traumas that could have happened in the person's life, um, i.e. Um, losing their housing, um, you know, financial, like filing for bankruptcy, um, you know, things like that. So in essence, I don't know of a, of a um, scale right now that people are using, but I do know that there's been some in the works. Um, and they sound really promising. And so the trauma-informed care approach is um, something that was originally looked at with um, child abuse situations. And so um, researchers and studies are just now kind of um, in the beginning stages of looking of how we can implement this approach with um, older adults. So um, I agree with Micah, there's a lot of things that are kind of in the works. And so we are all kind of staying tuned to see um, what um, assessment tools are kind of developed and what we can implement, but it's it's, pretty um, in the early stages. Great. Well, I think that's probably all we have really time for question-wise. If we go to the next slide. 
There is a post um, training survey. Um, you don't have to make a note of this URL or this web link. It will be in the follow up email that you get tomorrow after the event. So the speakers would appreciate it if you would take this optional post survey um, to let them know how they did and what you thought of the training. Next slide. And I think this is an email um, where you can reach um, our speakers today. Um, if you need to reach out to them, OCHRI at UCI.edu is one way to reach out to them. And then next slide. And then that is it. Here's the web address for the APS TARC, also the email address for the APS TARC if you'd like to reach out to us at any time. We want to thank uh, Cherie and Maika for presenting all of this wonderful information today. I learned a lot myself, actually, just listening, um, and I think it was very valuable for everyone who was able to attend. <clears throat> there will be a, a recording that will be distributed to everyone who's registered for this webinar that we will post online. We'll let you know when that is available in approximately two to three weeks, and there will be a brief evaluation that's four questions. Um, if you wouldn't mind doing that, taking that for us, it'll pop up as soon as we close things out. So again, thanks to our speakers today for all the information they uh, provided to us. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for attending today. Have a great rest of your week.